Okay, so in this session we're going to start introducing you to the idea of substrate metabolism. That is how we use energy and how we break it down, metabolize it for the generation of work. And how in other words, how we get a muscle, for example, to lengthen and shorten. And we're going to look at this throughout the course of this section of the module in relation to what we refer to as aerobic and anaerobic substrate metabolism. So aerobic being where we, we use oxygen, or oxygen it's, it takes place in the presence of oxygen. And anaerobic is referring to the generation of, of, of energy independently of oxygen. The common denominator, both aerobically and anaerobically, is ATP, the adenosine triphosphate molecule. And it is the ATP molecule that is used um, for the generation of muscular work. That is by deriving energy from this, it allows for our muscle to lengthen and shorten. So in today's session, we're going to start to introduce you to substrate metabolism and then look at this ATP molecule and find out A, how we get energy from it, and then I suppose importantly, how do you keep getting energy from it? Because remember, if we're talking about a game of football, then we're talking about 90 minutes. And we're talking about 90 minutes interspersed with a lot of high intensity activity and low intensity activity. So some of that, or a large proportion of that, and we looked about that previously, didn't we? We looked about nearly up to 11% of the game could be under anaerobic conditions. So we need to think about how do we keep deriving the energy anaerobically. So in the session, we're going to look initially at the relationship between exercise intensity, duration, and the amount of energy that it costs us. And if we understand that, we'll then start to understand the, where, well, the why we can only sustain high intensity exercise for short periods of time, and why we're able to sustain low intensity exercise for prolonged periods of time. Then I want us to understand the contributions of aerobic and anaerobic metabolism to exercise, and recognize that it's not just a case of, of, of referring to it being anaerobic exercise or aerobic exercise. It's the fact that even under both conditions, you're using the, the alternate energy source. So for example, even if, if we've got somebody who's, who's just walking, and we may refer to that as being aerobic exercise, there's actually a contribution to that work from anaerobic sources. In other words, what we're looking at is the, how the relative change changes. In other words, what's the ratio of aerobic to anaerobic metabolism in relation to the exercise intensity. Then we're going to look at the ATP molecule and what its role is um, and how we then get energy from that molecule in, in order for our muscle to, to change length. And then finally, we're going to look at the contribution of alactic substrate energy provision. So what do we mean by this? Well, this is the, the use of energy sources that themselves do not produce lactic acid. Now, that doesn't mean to say there is not lactic acid being produced but themselves do not produce lactic acid and how they contribute to energy provision. So let's start with some nice data. This is some data from Gastin. Uh, it's a nice paper. You can get this through the university library. But I know it's not soccer specific, but if you look at the, the table on the right hand side, you can see we've got 100 meters right the way down to something like an ultra marathon, 48 hours in down to this, this six day event. But what you can notice is, although the distance is increasing, we can, and we, we can see the speed is decreasing. So we, can, we see that no matter what we want to do, we can't sustain the speed that the, the, the athlete who broke the world record here for the 100 meters, this is going back a little bit, this is an athlete called Donovan Bailey, but ran the 100 meters in this instance, they ran it um, in, um, what have we got here? We've got a speed of 36 and a half kilometers an hour. Now, if we go to the 200, you think, well, hold on, that's gotten slightly quicker. Well, the 200 is coming off a, off, off a bend. We get a centrifugal force effect. But pop down to the 400. So now we've doubled the distance. But look at the drop in speed. The distance has gone up by 200 meters, but the speed has come down by, well, four kilometers an hour. We double the distance again. The speed has come down by five kilometers an hour. We add another 500 meters on. We've come down by, well, a kilometer an hour. We add on another 150 meters, we come down by half a kilometer an hour. So what we can see is actually when the distance, when the distance is very short and by definition of high intensity, we know they're high intensity because they are being covered at very high s speeds, that we suddenly get a very quick drop off. And once we get into these lower intensity efforts, in other words, these, these longer efforts, that you can see the drop off 
starts to become more linear. So in other words, the relationship between distance and speed is not perfectly linear. In fact, as you'll see, it is exponential. And you get this very sudden drop off. And then it starts to level out as the, as, as the distance starts to increase. And we'll talk about that in a, in a moment in more detail. The graph on the left-hand side just refers, and it doesn't matter what the units are, but it's referring to the relative contribution of aerobic and anaerobic energy in relation to those different distances. So you can see, for example, 200 meters, that you can see that a large proportion of the energy is coming from anaerobic sources. But what's interesting is if we go to 400 meters, the 400 meters is approximately a quarter of the amount of total amount of energy again on top of that encountered in the 200 meters. But what you notice is that the relative contribution, rather than being approximately, let's say, five sixths anaerobic for the 200, is now just over a quarter anaerobic for the 400. But if you go now to the 800, where we've doubled the distance again, the total energy cost has gone up from, let's say, 75 mils of O2 equivalent for the 200 to 150. In other words, we've, we've, we've doubled it. But the relative anaerobic contribution hasn't changed in terms of we're, we're still using the same amount, but its proportion to the total energy cost is now approximately a third. So what we're seeing is as the distance increases, the total amount of energy being used increases but the amount, in this, these cases, of energy coming anaerobically doesn't really change. So it's suggesting to us that the vast majority of the energy in 1,500 metres is aerobic, and that the vast majority of energy under 200 metres is anaerobic. So we're seeing that there is contributions across the spectrum from both aerobic and anaerobic sources, and that we don't just turn one energy source on and the other energy source off. So although we do refer to aerobic and anaerobic exercise and exercise intensities, it is perhaps a, 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 almost a wrong thing to do. That really what we're referring to is that if we're referring to anaerobic, it is that it is predominantly anaerobic. Or if it is aerobic, it is predominantly aerobic. And that there is a contribution from both energy sources to the work that's being undertaken. OK, so again from the Gaston paper, um, but this is quite neat. Here we've got the relative uh, contributions from aerobic and anaerobic sources across different distances. So, anything, well, different times, I should say. So anything from about 10 seconds, which we could equate, couldn't we, to a 100 meter sprinter, up to something like four minutes, which we could equate to, let's say, a, a decent middle, or a relatively decent middle distance runner. But what you can see, even if you take the 100 meters, the 10 seconds effort, 6% of the energy is being derived aerobically. So it says straight away that even under those conditions, you can't sustain the speed, that really high intensity speed for the full duration. In other words, you might start to slow down. And we see that in a 100 meter event. We see that, the, that, that once the athletes reach around about 70 meters, they start to slow down. And that's already suggesting to us that there isn't enough energy available to work anaerobically. If there was, then it would be 100% anaerobic. It there wouldn't, have, wouldn't be an aerobic contribution. And we can see if we go down to something like 240 seconds worth of work, that it's now still a large contribution is, is anaerobic, 21%. But the vast majority is now aerobic, 79%. So we can see that as the distance increases, the relative contribution from the aerobic and the anaerobic sources changes. And that we're going from predominantly anaerobic up to around about the, uh, the mark of um, 75 seconds, where we get near enough 50-50 split, to predominantly aerobic when we go to anything around about 90 seconds upwards. So if we think about something like soccer, where we're talking about short duration sprints, then they would be predominantly anaerobic, but a little aerobic contribution. But the vast majority of the game is that lower intensity effort where they're doing walking, standing, cruising, and so on. So it may conform to a product more aerobically orientated, but still being having an energy contribution from anaerobic sources. So let's think about this. Well, here we've got what we refer to as our um, energy spectrum. And you can see that we're referring to the energy output, in this case, in kilocals per minute. It doesn't matter what the units, the units are or how we derive it. But what we can see is if we think about our 10 second sprint, so if we look at the time axis, 
So the 10 second sprint, we knew it was run at the fastest speed. We saw that on that, on that graph from Gaston. And you can see that um, the, the energy that's being used, it looks like it, they, they sustained 10 seconds. You can see it's coming predominantly, it seems to refer to here, from ATP PC. But you can see that after a couple of seconds, if you follow the, the dotted line down, it starts to, you start to run out of this, and you start to get less energy coming from it after about six seconds. Hence, what I referred to in terms of the athletes slowing down. But it doesn't mean they stop. What you can see is, as they start to run out of this energy, they rely on a second source, which you start to see coming in almost instantaneously, which is anaerobic glycolysis. But notice that as the energy coming from this ATP CP starts to decrease, and you get this crossover, look at the total amount of energy the output. So in other words, you've seen that the speed, they are starting to slow down. The speed is slowing down. So as you then move into more oxidative, this is aerobic, although you can sustain it for longer, the total energy output is far, far lower than it would be for this exercise of very short duration, high intensity. And this is fundamental to our understanding of the way in which um, we, we, we think about uh, sports and systems physiology. That if it's high intensity, short duration, you can only sustain it for that short period of time. And it is around about, as we're going to look at, six to ten seconds for this very high intensity exercise. You can still sustain quite high intensity anaerobic exercise, but not as high as it would be for this very short duration stuff. And you can sustain it for a lot longer. But if you get down to the low intensity, exercise where it becomes aerobic, you can sustain it for an awful lot longer, but you sustain it at a lower exercise intensity. And it's recognizing that there's this interplay between these energy systems, that as much as we would love to sustain that high intensity effort for a prolonged period of time, it is not feasibly uh, possible for an athlete to do. So the, the, the result is that we, we've got this high amount of, uh, this high speed, this high intensity, but can only be sustained for, prolong for a short period of time. So it's suggesting to us that we have limited stores of what is referred to as here as ATP and CP. Now, just to clear this up, CP is something you may have come across as, uh, in other readings. It's referred to as, as creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine. Doesn't matter really what the abbreviation is. It could be, you could read it CP, PC, or even PCR. They're technically referring to the, the, the same thing. And we'll, we'll look at that in more detail as we go through this, this session today. But we can also see from this graph that the, there is an interplay between all the energy pathways, just like the Gaston data was referring to us. So even when we're doing 10 seconds of work, you can see, look, that small contribution from oxidative metabolism, aerobic metabolism, quite a large contribution coming from anaerobic glycolysis, but the vast majority coming from this ATP PC, hence the higher speeds. And what we're going to look at now is how we start to derive the energy from ATP to do that, that work that is getting the muscle to lengthen. Now, here's our energy spectrum. And in the middle of the energy spectrum, you can see um, we've got a football player. Now, let's, let's show you why football sits there. Well, at the top end of the spectrum, we'd have something like a 100-meter sprint. So you can see that the intensity is very high, <clears throat> but the ab ability to sustain it is very short. So they can't sustain that intensity, as, as again, the Gaston data shows us, for a prolonged period of time. If we come a bit further down, we've got something like a 400 meter race. The intensity is slightly lower, but it is now prolonged for that, for, for that bit longer. So we're going from maybe 10 seconds, at, in this case, let's say 38 kilometers an hour for 100 meters, down to 45 seconds, are getting down to around about 33 kilometers an hour. Then we come down to, to, to soccer. And remember, soccer, that, that the players are covering something like 10 to 12 kilometers in 90 minutes. So we're coming quite a way down the spectrum now. So a lot slower overall average speed than under uh, 400 meters or clearly a 100 meter race, but they are able to sustain it for an awful lot longer. We come even further down, and we've got something like time trialing or even long distance bike races um, where the speed, if you were converted it to equivalents of, 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 of speed from running, would be a lot lower. Although it, it, clarify what I mean there, that with something like cycling, it would look like it's a lot quicker, but they're on a bike, don't forget. But if we look at this in terms of the intensity, the relative intensity, um, it would be lower than something like a game of soccer, because they're sustaining it for a longer period of time. They might be in the saddle for seven, eight hours in some stage races. So 
we can see that there's something going on very different in something like a bike race as there is in a game of football to a 400 meter race. And then we go to the far end of the spectrum where we've got something like ultra marathons. So these guys might be running for prolonged periods of time, hours and hours. I mean, um, equivalents, this, this photo is taken from somebody running through Death Valley in Nevada and they might be running 135 miles. Um, and this race they actually run 135 miles and the temperatures are around about 57 to 58 degrees C, so it's extreme conditions. But the key point is this, as much as they would love to, they can't sustain in that, uh, that ultramarathon race the speeds that the 100 meter sprinters are sustaining. They can't even sustain the speed that somebody like Michael Johnson in that 400 meter photo is sustaining, or, 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 or Messi is sustaining, sustaining in the football match. So we know that there's something limiting the ability to sustain these high intensity efforts. And the limitation comes from the amount of available energy to do that, those high intensity efforts and the associated byproducts of doing that kind of exercise. And I'll explain what I mean by byproducts as we go further through this, this uh, section of the module. But it's important to recognize that the limitations are the sustainable amount of energy that you have and the, and the byproducts, byproducts that have been produced. And if you understand this energy continuum that you have here, then you really have got an understanding of the fundamentals of exercise physiology that if it is high intensity, it is short duration. If it is low intensity, it can be sustained for a longer duration. And that is the, it's the basis of everything we need to think about in terms of the way in which the body functions physiologically. So let's think about this, this idea then of energy. Now, when we're talking about muscles, we're thinking about the muscles contracting, this idea of muscles lengthening and shortening. So if we think about that, the idea is that a muscle is going to contract. Now, I've referred to this in previous lectures about muscle contraction. They don't really contract per se. They change length. So they go from maybe they lengthen, they will shorten. But in order for that to happen, energy is required. The energy is provided by adenosine triphosphate, ATP. And it's important to recognize the next bit. It's the only energy capable of being used for these contractions in humans. So if the muscle is going to lengthen and shorten, the energy is going to be derived from the ATP molecule. And remember that the ATP molecule is housed inside the, the muscle fiber in those sarcomeres, and that we, we, we use the ATP molecule, in essence, for those sarcomeres to pull closer together or to pull further apart. Now, what is interesting is muscles can only lengthen and shorten if they have ATP available. Of course, if ATP is not available, they, they can't change length. And actually, that is a condition you may have heard of, which is rigor. So in the conditions of rigor, um, we, don't have, we don't have the ability to generate energy from the ATP molecule. So in other words, the muscles can't change length. And that's the classic condition of rigor mortis, where somebody may have died. And initially, the muscles are held in quite a, a, a taut, rigid state because there is no mechanism left in order for the energy to derive from this, from this molecule. So what I would like to do at this point is just start to reflect on the way in which muscles change length, just to give us a refresher so that we can kind of see where the ATP molecule sits within the, all, within the whole of this process. So here we've got this, this schematic on, on the right hand side of a muscle action. The idea of the interplay between the actin and the myosin filaments and that it's the, 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 the cross bridge attachment of the myosin head onto the actin filament that pulls the one filament past the other, that is the changing of the muscle length. Now, the whole of that process is dependent upon what we refer to as the splitting of the ATP molecule. That is deriving energy from the ATP in order for that myosin head to attach and pull the one filament past the other. If the ATP is not present, then that splitting cannot happen. So we, we recognize straight away how significant the ATP molecule is to the, to the change in muscle length. Now, when the muscle changes length, what, what is of course happening is that the whole process begins with the calcium ions flooding in from the T-tubules. They flood in, they bind to the troponin, which reveals the tropomyosin complex, which once that tropomyosin complex is revealed, we've now got an active binding site for the myosin head. 
but it doesn't matter how many calcium ions flood in, it doesn't matter how many uh, of these binding sites we make available, unless ATP is present, and unless you can get the energy from the ATP molecule, you won't get cross-bridge attachment, and you won't get the shortening of the muscle. So the power stroke, that is this movement of the myosin head, is an ATP-dependent process. And so by definition, what we need to understand is how much ATP is used, where do we get the ATP from, and how do we keep getting the ATP? Because quite clearly, we don't just produce one, one muscle contraction. We're quite clearly producing lots and lots of actions in order to produce lots and lots of different activities during our game of soccer or during the training that we're going to undertake and, and, and so on. Well, before we get to this, I just want to take you right inside one of those, those fibers and deal with the cell. Now, the cells, different, different structures have different cells. They look slightly different, but they all contain the same key variables. So the key variables that just define cells, we can see some of them here, things like a nucleus. And the nucleus really describes the cell for us. It is very much the barcode of the cell. You scan a barcode at a supermarket, and if you've got a scanning device, it will tell you what it is. And so the nucleus defines for us what this, this cell is going to do. And then we've got things like endoplasmic reticulum and ribosomes, which, which in essence are involved in the building blocks of these, of these cells. But the bit that we're really interested in is the bit that I'm just highlighting there for you, which is what's referred to as a mitochondrion or a mitochondria. And the reason we're interested in it, and here we've got a view of it under an electron microscope, is that the mitochondria is referred to in some books as the powerhouse of the cell. It's a term I really don't like. But I want to explain why people refer to it as that. Well, it's referred to as the powerhouse of the cell because it is in the mitochondria where the process of aerobic, aerobic respiration takes place, not anaerobic. So in that mitochondria is where the aerobic generation of ATP will occur. Now, what we're dealing with today is the anaerobic generation of ATP. And I've just removed the mitochondria for you. If you look surrounding all these what are called organelles, these structures, you can see what is, is on this schematic is like a little like light blue colouring. And in the cell, that is referred to as the cytosol of the cell, the cytosol of the cell. And it is an aqueous-based material. And it is in the aqueous-based material outside of the mitochondria that the processes of anaerobic energy provision take place. So in other words, the generation of energy to do anaerobic oxygen-independent work occurs outside of the mitochondria. It occurs inside the cell, but it occurs in this, this aqueous-like substance. If we're dealing with aerobic, then it's inside the mitochondria. Now let's just go back in the mitochondria. And if you look inside it, you can see all these striations. These striations that run from the outside to the inside are referred to as Christi. And the Christi is actually the location where aerobic metabolism and aerobic generation of ATP takes place. To put it in context, the mitochondria itself, the size of a single mitochondria, is one five millionth of a millimeter in size. Now, I find that quite extraordinary. So we're dealing with a structure that is a five millionth of a millimetre in size. So we're probably talking about a, a Christi being the region of one twentieth of a million or one thirtieth of a million, one thirty millionth of a millimetre or one twenty millionth of a millimetre in size where ATP is generated. So we're talking about incredibly small structures involved in the generation of ATP aerobically. So bear in mind, that if it's anaerobic, it's outside of the mitochondria. If it's aerobic, it's inside the mitochondria. But they are linked. And we're just going to look at this linkage between the two very briefly before we start to look at actually how we use ATP. Now, we're going to come back to the mitochondria in, in subsequent weeks, in subsequent sessions. But I thought it was worth introducing it here just to, so you understand the relationship between what's going on inside and, and outside of the, of the cell. Well, 
as I said, it's referred to the power, powerhouse of the cell and is the site of oxidate, oxidative phosphorylation and therefore the aerobic generation of ATP, aerobic metabolism. But I've also said that the, that the, the role of the mitochondria is linked to what is going on outside of the cell. How? Well, the link is the fact that the membrane is permeable. In fact, actually, what it perhaps should be is semi-permeable. And the reason for that is that the membrane is permeable to certain chemical uh, outputs from anaerobic metabolism. And these are what are referred to as ions. And importantly, the ion that they are permeable to are hydrogen ions. So H plus, which is hydrogen ions. Now, why is that important? Well, it is important because during anaerobic glycolysis, so that is the generation of ATP under anaerobic glycolytic conditions, something we're going to look at in the next session, one of the byproducts, and I mentioned earlier on that byproducts are important, one of the byproducts is the generation of hydrogen ions. And these hydrogen ions are pumped from the cytosol that is from the extracellular environment into this intracellular environment, into the, into the mitochondria, and as you'll see, are fundamental in terms of the generation of ATP. So the membrane has to be permeable to those as a structure. But we'll come back to that in subsequent sessions. Okay, now you don't need to worry about the units, um, but this is nice data from a review paper by by a German group led by Heck um, in the European Journal of Sports Sciences. And the reason I put it on is because it just, just shows for us the, the relationship between power and capacity. So we've got three units or three systems here, which is alactic, lactic, and aerobic. Now, don't worry so much about the terms, but alactic is this idea of, of using substrates, using energy sources that themselves do not produce lactic acid. And again, don't worry really what lactic acid is for the moment. Then we've got lactic. These are energy sources which are, in this instance, anaerobic and are associated with the byproduct of lactic acid and lactate. And then we've got aerobic energy sources which are either using, in this case, we refer to as glycogen or fatty acids. But look, the amount of power that's being produced under these alactic conditions is around about 3.3 .3 to 6 millimoles per kilogram per second. But you've only got the capacity to do around about 20 to 25 millimoles per kilogram of this high intensity work. It doesn't matter, as I say, what the units are, but if you come down to the lactic, so this is still under anaerobic conditions, but we're using glycogen. Now look, the power is half, but the capacity to do that work is double. So you get half the power, so half the speed, but you can sustain it, it looks like, for twice the amount of time, possibly even longer. So go back to that energy continuum that we put on a couple of slides ago. And you can think, well, actually, that kind of conforms, doesn't it? That we could see that the 100 meter sprint could be sustained high speed, but for a short period of time. And that they, they couldn't sustain it for very long. And actually, when somebody's looking at, say, 400 meters, the speed is a lot lower, but they can sustain that speed for longer. And then we go to aerobic. And look at the aerobic. We're talking about something like 0.2 to 0.4 millimoles per kilogram per second, so much, much lower power that's being produced at the muscle. But actually, you could sustain this for a heck of a long period of time. In fact, what is interesting is you could probably sustain just using fats on their own for about 96 hours of continual exercise. You could probably sustain using glycogen. Now, glycogen is a form of carbohydrate. You could probably sustain that aerobically for around about 90 minutes continual exercise. If we're talking about lactic acid, uh, sorry, lactate, and lactic as they've got here, this is using glycogen, you can probably sustain that for around about two minutes, 90 seconds to two minutes. If we're talking about a lactic, maximum of 10 seconds. But I can run or cover greater distance for those 10 seconds than I can for any of the others. So this is interplay between the amount of work that can be done and how long you can sustain it for which lends itself to our understanding of the fact that we have limited capacity in terms of these high energy sources, the ATPPC. We've got a bigger capacity for these 
lower intensity sources, but the fact we, is we can't sustain them for as long a period of time. So let's get on to then what ATP is. And this is fundamental, as I, as I have said previously. So let's think about the ATP molecule. Well, the ATP molecule is, is the adenosine triphosphate molecule. And we know that if we, we, we take either something like a muscle biopsy, so we, we, we could take a, a, a sample from the muscle, or we, we do something like an MRI scan, we know that the human body has got enough ATP, well, it's got in, yeah, enough ATP for one single explosive muscular contraction. Enough. 80 to 100 grams is the, the maximum amount you've probably got stored in the body. And what's interesting is even if you train somebody and you make them do know, strength or power training, they won't increase the amount of ATP that is stored. Now this offers us a problem, because if you've only got enough for one single muscular contraction, you imagine that, that you're in a game of soccer, it kicks off, you kick the ball, that's it, you're stuck. Because ATP is the currency that we need for the muscle to change length, but according to this, you've only got enough for the muscle to change length once. So it tells us straight away that we need to find ways of resynthesizing ATP. In other words, once we've used it, there's got to be other ways, or we hope there's other ways, of being able to make the ATP up and so we can keep getting energy from it. So we've only got enough stored in its form for one muscle contraction. But there must be ways in which we can keep producing it to keep producing those continual muscle actions that you see throughout sport. Why? Is this the case? Well, it's beneficial. ATP is actually a heavy molecule. So you would have to store vast quantities in order to do sustained periods of work. So if you imagine something like um, um, a game of football, and you think about, well, how many times does a muscle change length in a game of football? Well, you know, it might be, let's say that it changes length. I mean, even if, if we, we probably under, underestimate it, but let's say it's, it's 20,000 times in a game of football. And if you multiply 20,000 by 100, then of course what you get is 200,000. And then if you think about that, then that's 200,000 grams. So you're talking, you know, you're talking in terms of the, the amount of ATP that would have to be stored. It's vast quantities of ATP that have to be stored. So evolutionary-wise, it's been beneficial for the, for the human body not to store vast quantities of ATP, but to find alternate sources of resynthesizing ATP. Now, what we have to think about is we're happy, I think, in the idea that we have to perhaps have limited stores of ATP. But the question is then, let's take that ATP molecule We'll get to the resynthesizing in a moment, but let's think about the ATP molecule. How do you get energy from it? Because quite clearly, I've mentioned earlier on that we split it. I said we split it, and that's what derives the energy for a muscle to change length. That is what used for that for myosin head to attach to the acting filament. So how do we get the energy from this? Well, the simple answer is we get the energy from it with what is recognized as being the, the simplest chemical reaction known to man. And that is this, the addition of water. It is the process of hydrolysis that is used to derive the energy from the ATP molecule. So let's have a look at this. Here we've got our adenosine triphosphate molecule that you can see. And what you see is on the right hand side, you've got the, the adenosine component. And on the left hand side, you've got three phosphates. In other words, adenosine tri, that is three, phosphates. Now, as it sits like that, that molecule is not imparting any energy. It's got potential energy, but we need to get that energy from it. And it works like this. You have the ATP to which you add water. And you, you'll see in a moment it's a reversible reaction. That's what the, the arrows going in both directions mean. But by adding water, we get what is called ADP plus PI plus H plus. What does that all mean? Well, what it means is that you end up with what you see now in top right, which is 
ADP is adenosine, because you look, the adenosine molecule on the right hasn't changed, diphosphate, di for two. So by adding the water to the ATP, you've taken a phosphate molecule off. Well, where's that gone? Well, it's in that equation. You can see it. Look, ADP plus PI. PI is our symbol, chemical symbol, for phosphate. So by splitting the phosphate molecule off, that has what has released the energy. Now, don't worry about the hydrogen ion. The hydrogen ions are floating around in the milieu of the cell. But it's important that we recognize there is a hydrogen ion associated with this, with this process, that it is there. But by adding the water, we release the energy. And that release of the energy is what is used for the power stroke of the myosin head to pull the actin filament past the myosin filament. Now, all chemical processes require a facilitator. So they don't just happen. And the facilitator here, as in most, is what we refer to as a catalyst. And the catalyst in this case is an enzyme called ATPase. We know it's an enzyme because it's got an ase on the end of it. So if you're reading material, you're reading textbooks, and you see an ase, then you know it's an enzyme. What are important about enzymes? Well, enzymes drive chemical reactions. And so we know that the more we've got of an enzyme, the faster the chemical process can work. We also know that enzymes never end up in the final outcome of that chemical process. So if you look in the equation in yellow, you'll notice that ATPase doesn't appear anywhere within that. It drives it. So the chemical reaction has to work in the presence of the enzyme ATPase. And in fact, we know that if you train somebody, two things are, are, are quite interesting. One, we don't increase the amount of ATP that we have. Well, that's, that's we've referred to that previously. That's a biological um, um, Adaptation. There's no point storing vast amounts of it because it's heavy. But we can increase the amount of ATPase. In other words, we can speed up this reaction to generate this, this amount of energy that's being produced. The other thing to bear in mind is that this is not a particularly efficient process. Um, the, 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 the splitting of the ATP molecule, actually 75% of the energy is lost in the form of heat. And so worth bearing that in mind. This explains why we generate vast amounts of heat when we do exercise. Because the molecule is being split and you're producing a lot of energy, um, sorry, a lot of heat. And that heat has to be removed away from the body, otherwise the, 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 the core temperature starts to rise. And if the core temperature starts to rise, it has all sorts of biological implications that we'll, we'll, we'll discuss further in this course with you. So heat is a, is, is a byproduct of this of this process, or in fact of, of, of most chemical processes, but particularly this chemical process. Now, this process here of hydrolysis is so important to understand that whenever you have got an ATP molecule from now on, the only way you're going to get the energy from the ATP molecule is in the presence of water and the enzyme ATPase. But as you can see, as we've already referred to, once you've split it, then the energy has gone. You've done it. You've, you've done the work. I've got the energy from it, but that's in, I've got enough ATP to do that once. So we now need to think about, well, there must be a, we must be a way, because we know we do more than one muscle action, of, of resynthesizing the ATP and continually getting energy from it. In other words, resynthesize it, add it to water, get energy. Resynthesize it, add it to water, get energy. So what we're going to look at now is the first way that the body will always turn to, irrespective of whether it's under what you would think of aerobic conditions or anaerobic conditions. And that will be explained to you more clearly as we go through the module. So we're going to look at the first way. Well, what do we do? Well, the first approach is to use what is called creatine. Now, creatine is a product of protein metabolism found in muscle. It's phosphate, now there's the link. It's phosphate, it's called creatine phosphate. Acts as a store of high energy phosphate in muscle and serves to maintain adequate amounts of ATP. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, remember that you were left at the end of that process of hydrolysis with an ADP molecule. So the only thing you can do is presumably put phosphates back onto it to get you ATP, add it to water to get energy. Creatine 
phosphate is rich in phosphate molecules. So if there's a way of creatine phosphate donating its phosphates to ADP, that would give you ATP, then you add the water, and then you get the energy. So that's what we're going to look at. And creatine phosphate is this first donor. And as I said a moment ago, we tend to think of this under the anaerobic high intensity conditions. Because this is, is the energy source that is going to allow you to continue to produce energy anaerobically very, very rapidly. So if you think about those sprinters, or you think about those, those very, very rapid changes of speed, those very high intensity efforts in a game of soccer, then the, the fuel source that's going to be used is creatine phosphate. But it's also used at the onset of exercise, even if it's aerobic. And that is because even under those conditions, even if you're walking, the first energy source to be used is anaerobic. Now that's a bit of a, 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 you know, a bit of a, a mind screw for you, but just highlight that in your notes, and we'll come back to that later. That even under aerobic conditions, the first energy source that would always be used is anaerobic. But for the moment, let's just think about this in the context of high intensity sprints. So those very very short sharp sprints, and again, the football, or if it's easier to think about it, think of it in relation to something like a hundred meter sprint. So let's have a look at this, creatine phosphate. Well, the normal creatine phosphate uh, in muscle is around about 125 millimoles per kilogram cubed. This is from data from, as I got here, by Forsberg. Now, we know that um, we can increase that through training. Um, and in fact, we can increase it up to the upper limit, which is around about 142 to 144 millimoles per kilogram cubed. Now, you have to think about what creatine is. Well, creatine is a, is a protein, as I said on the previous slide. Now, where do you derive it from? Well, you derive it either from training, or you can derive it exogenously. That is, you can derive it from the diet. And of course, when you're eating meat, you're eating muscle. And creatine is predominantly stored in muscle. And so by eating meat, you are ingesting creatine. And in fact, that is stored, some of that is stored and taken up and stored in the muscle. And it is stored within the cytosol of the cell. Remember I said earlier on that the cytosol of the cell is where anaerobic energy provision occurs. Now, two little important points here is that we know that the creatine content is higher in males than it is in females. The predominant reason for that being males have a greater muscle mass. And if the muscle is where the vast majority is stored, then you're going to naturally going to have higher content in males. The second thing is that the creatine content is higher in people who eat meat than it is in vegetarians, because, of course, you are, by definition, ingesting creatine. So a female vegetarian could, it could be argued, is at a natural physical disadvantage to um, anybody who eats meat, or even to a male meat eater, because the creatine content will be higher much, much lower in the female vegetarian than it is in the individuals who are eating, who are eating meat. Although the vast majority of the creatine is stored in, in, in muscle, you've also got a large amount, not a large amount, but a reasonable amount stored in, in the kidneys, and then a very small amount, that 1% is stored in the, in the testes. Now, we, we put the two components together, ATP, so there's our, that's our energy currency, PCR provides instantaneous energy under anaerobic conditions. In other words, it's, it's seamless from using that first ATP molecule to using the PCR to resynthesize ATP. You, you don't get any change in the amount of energy being produced, the output. So it's a seamless, instantaneous, instantaneous provider of energy under anaerobic conditions. So let's have a look how this works. Well, here we've got um, different athletes, different soccer players, um, maybe sprinting or, or whatever, but in our, in our chemical equation you can see PCR. Now we've got our ADP molecule that we're left with at the end of hydrolysis. PCR plus ADP gives us ATP plus CR, which is creatine, plus phosphate, plus hydrogen ion. So in other words, we've donated a phosphate from the creatine phosphate molecule We've given it to ADP. It's produced ATP, which has left us now with a creatine and a phosphate molecule. But notice that it's reversible. That means that although you gave it to ADP, you've 
you, you've actually got, you haven't used all the phosphates up. So we can reattach the phosphates back to creatine to give us creatine phosphate, and then we can start the process again. So we can donate again to ADP to give us ATP. We can then, because we've split it off, we can then attach what's left in terms of the phosphates, attach them back to the creatine. So we've, we've lost one because we've donated it out, don't forget. So we're getting, attaching them back together, back to PCR, add it to ADP, gives us ATP. Now, I said earlier that these all these kind of reactions occur in the presence of an enzyme. No different here. And our enzyme this time is creatine kinase. You may read this as CK or CPK, which is creatine phosphate kinase. They're the same enzyme. And the creatine kinase drives the reaction. And again, something we know with training studies is that athletes that are exposed to high intensity speed training will get a slight increase in the PCR content, but a significant increase in the creatine kinase content. In other words, they generate the um, conversion, that is the donation of a, a piece of the phosphate from PCR to ADP, far more quickly than people with lower creatine kinase contents. So a fundamental adaptation um, to training. But, there is a but. Remember, that you can't sustain these high intensity speeds for prolonged periods of time. So that suggests to us that this donation of phosphates from creatine is limited. And it is. There is a point where you run out of phosphates attached to the creatine phosphate molecule. And so you can't keep working at this high intensity effort for prolonged periods of time. So we need to investigate that and look at how and why it is. Well, this schematic, I think, is one of those schematics that you look at initially and go, wow, wee, what on earth is this? Well, this is from that HEC paper that I mentioned earlier on. Now, if you look in the middle, you've got PCR, and that within all of, the three, all of the lines, the different colors, the middle dotted line refers to normal content. The solid line refers, for example, if we've got an increase through training, and the large dashed line refers to if we've got a decrease as a result of, say, detraining. Now, what are we looking at? Well, here we've got um, our PCR, we're doing high intensity exercise, and you can see, as we referred to earlier on, that the PCR content starts to fall, <coughs> excuse me, and it starts to fall quite rapidly, and after a few seconds, we start to rely on what they've referred to as DLA uh, backslash DT, which is the hyphen that they're referring to um, for glycolysis. So it's saying to us, that, we, have, that we, we can't sustain this high intensity energy release for a prolonged period of time. But it's also showing us, look, that the creatine content is almost gone within 10 to 12 seconds. So it says for us that although we have 125, maybe up to 140 to 144 millimoles per kilogram cubed of this stored in the muscle, after 10 to 12 seconds of high intensity, maximum intensity exercise, it's been depleted. And after about, if you look on the graph, after around about six seconds, do you notice that the DLADT, that is the anaerobic glycolysis, starts to predominate in terms of supplying energy. So we're starting to get a decline in available energy at six seconds using this, and it's gone within 10 seconds. So it's limited, which explains why our 100 meter sprinter would start slowing down at 60 to 70 meters, but it also explains why in a game of football, you can't keep doing multiple sprints all the time. You've got limited stores of energy to carry on. Okay, so this graph is actually very important to us, and we'll come back to this in, in, in later, later weeks. But we are getting this impression that we've got limited stores of what we refer to as a high energy phosphates. So ATP is phosphate bound, PCR, phosphate bound. So there's limited stores of these high energy phosphates, which we can see, as I've just mentioned, in terms of the fact that they're limited shows for us why we can't sustain the high energy outputs for prolonged periods of time. So, this poses us a problem. If they're limited, and we've used them up, 
and I'm playing a game of soccer, how can I keep doing multiple sprints? Well, the answer is you can also resynthesize PCR. So as much as we're using the PCR to resynthesize the ATP, we are able to resynthesize the PCR, but it occurs under very specific exercise conditions. Let's have a look at these. Well, there's a nice study by Hervonen um, in 1987, which was the one that really showed for us that you've got enough PCR for maximum exercise on average for around about six seconds. And in most people, it's an eight to 10 second depletion. Very well trained sprinters, it might be up to say about possibly 12 seconds, but that'd be pushing it, um, to be brutally honest. But most people, it's around about eight to 10 seconds before it's completely depleted. So what is fascinating? is that the restoration, that is the resynthesis of PCR, is in itself an oxygen dependent process. So it's an anaerobic energy source, but you will be able to um, resynthesize it, restore it, only under aerobic conditions. Now, start to think about that in relation to a game of football. We know there are large periods of time where the athlete is working at lower intensities. We've seen data in previous weeks when they're standing, they're walking, they're jogging, they're lower intensity ex uh, exercise periods, which means there's larger quantities of oxygen being um, taken in. But importantly, there are fast and slow components to this. And the fast and slow components are actually related to what we've looked at in previous weeks, which is muscle fiber types. If we think about it, the fiber type of choice for this kind of work, this high intensity work, is a fast twitch fiber. That is fibers that are able to produce um, outputs, energy outputs very, very rapidly, but they can't sustain them for prolonged periods of time. They are rich in PCR. They have higher, higher stores of PCR in fast twitch fibers than you do in a slow twitch fiber. But the restoration of PCR is oxygen dependent. That suggests to us that a slow twitch fiber would actually get its restoration of PCR far quicker because it's got the, 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 the capillary network, it's got high levels of mitochondria. In other words, it's got the aerobic um, components in place that would allow for the restoration of the PCR. Hence we get, as Tesh has reported for us here, a fast and slow restoration. That is, that we get this very, very quick, re quick replenishment, which occurs in the slow twitch fibers, which interestingly, of course, won't have had much of a depletion of the PCR, and then slower replenishment in the fast, tw fast twitch fibers because they don't really have the, um, the, the, the physiological machinery, which is, as efficient in, 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 which is as efficient in the fast twitch fibers as it is in a slow twitch fiber. And this offers us up some very, very important findings. We know that it takes approximately one minute to get a 50% restoration of PCR. But that's one minute of doing the appropriate intensity of exercise. And you might like to go away and think about what that intensity of exercise would be. And perhaps, you know, that's, that's a, for a discussion point um, on the VLE, on, um, uh, on the, one of the discussion groups, is how intense should this be? But we get one minute restoration in about, uh, sorry, we get 50% restoration in about one minute. That's quite fast. That must mean the, the, uh, the slow twitch fibers. The slower components, well, what do we know? We get about 85%, so we only get an extra 35% on top of that 50%. An 85% restoration in around about six minutes. And in fact, we're looking at anything between 30 to 60 minutes for total restoration. Again, dependent upon the, the amount of oxygen that's coming in. And the key is it cannot occur at rest. So I want you to think about how intense the exercise would have to be in order to facilitate this restoration of PCR. But it's, an, it's, 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 it's a very important point. And it does ha happen to help us explain what we see in a game of football. The fact that the athletes and the players will do these very short bursts of exercise, there might be these lower intensity blocks of work, and then do it again. And that's because they're getting some of the restoration of the PCR. So let's have a look at that. Well, here's some data. This is laboratory-derived data. It doesn't matter that it's in a lab. 
but the, the application is the same. This was done on a cyclotometer, and in this instance, the athletes were asked to produce a series of maximum intensity sprints. There were five um, second, sorry, ten second sprints on a cyclotometer, and we got the wattage. The wattage is the, the power output they produced, and you can see that um, they were given in this instance a, a minute recovery between each one. So they'd sprint for, for 10 seconds and a minute recovery. You can see that um, if we go from sprint two, sprint one slightly lower, we go from sprint two, you can see that the power output is continually falling. Why? Well, with a minute recovery, you're only getting 50% restoration of the, um, <coughs> the ATP PCR that was used. So you get this natural decline in the amount of output that occurs, which means that they would have been relying on other less efficient sources. Remember back to that chart I put up from Heck earlier in the session, which ref referred to the fact that ATP PC, very high powers, but the capacity is limited. Whereas if you go something like glycolysis, which we're going to look at in subsequent weeks, you get lower power, but the capacity is a lot greater. And we can see that in this graph here, that you can see that the power is, is, is consistently falling across these, these trials with a one minute recovery. Well, what about if we change the recovery? Here we've got a six second sprint. So at six seconds, we could assume, let's say, that they, they've used, let's be, let's be say, 60% of the ATP PC. And we compare a 60 second rest to a 30 second rest. And look at the difference the amount of rest has on, on this. So they're doing six seconds. And again, 60%. But even with this, the, the, the 60 second rest, you can see there is a gradual, it's only small, but a gradual decline. But if you look at the, the 30 second rest, it's a substantial decline. If remember, you're getting 50% restoration in one minute doing the appropriate exercise. So here, it's not quite right, but let's do the basic maths. It's around about 25% restoration. So in other words, they're starting each sprint in a depleted not totally depleted, but in a depleted state, the PCR. In other words, they've got less energy available to produce power. So now equate this to a game of football, and you suddenly think, this has implications for the way in which they, they play. That the athlete will do these short, sharp sprints, and they have to recover, because they have to restore some of the PCR to be able to do the next subsequent sprint. And that the key to being able to do this in a game of football is a function of of having both high PCR stores, but also being aerobically fit. Remember that the restoration of PCR is an oxygen dependent process. And then finally, this just shows you, this is, this, this is using supplementation, um, but don't, don't necessarily worry about that as, 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 as such. But you can see the difference between having a high creatine content in the black versus a low creatine content, or a, a normal creatine content in the white, the placebo. And you can see that if the creatine content is higher, therefore you've increased the capacity, you can sustain the effort for a longer period of time. Still drops off, but you don't get the drop off as rapidly as you see with a normal creatine content in muscle. So it shows us that the limiting factor here is the capacity to do the work, that the store is limited. Hence, why we can't sustain these high intensity sprints for prolonged periods of time. And hence why even in the game of football that we see drop offs in the second half compared to the first half in terms of the intensity of the sprints being undertaken. So big implications for us in terms of applied um, football performance. Well let's have a football focus at this point and let's think about what, how all what we've looked at today relates to the game of soccer, and perhaps try and put it in a bit more of a football orientated focus for you. Well, here's um, some data, and this is um, we've got data which is a series of sprints that complete uh, completed pre, after the first half, and then after the second half. Um, and what you can see is the number of sprints. We've looked at something similar to this before, but it's the time taken. So they're doing 30 meter sprints, and of course, what you see is filled circles, so the completed pre-filled circles. Then you can see after the first half open, so you can see that they were getting slower at the end of the first half in the latter sprints. And then if you look at the, after the second half, substantially slower. So this is telling us, let's assume everything else is 
is not changing. Well, don't worry about fatigue and so on at the moment in terms of byproducts and whatever. But if we take this at its simplest level, this is suggesting to us that in a football situation, the ability to do multiple sprints, which is what this is simulating here, is affected by the amount of PCR that the athletes got. In other words, in that game of football, when they started it, they've got a lot of PCR in the muscle. They can do these multiple sprints. But by the time they get to the end of the first half, that PCR content would have decreased because they've already played 45 minutes. They've covered maybe six kilometers, in which they'll have done about 11% of that six kilometers will have been doing sprints on average, two to four seconds worth of sprints. So they've already done a lot of these short, sharp bursts of activity. And they're doing those every 90 seconds. So the creatine content in the muscle is decreasing. So as a result, their ability to, to run fast starts to drop off. So there's a big decrease between first and second, uh, sorry, the start of the game and the end of the first half, but look at the drop off now to the second half. Now they've completed 11 to 12 kilometers of total distance, still maintaining around 11% of the total distance of sprints, doing one every 90 seconds, but we've got, must have, by definition, a significant decrease now in the PCR content, because they played 90 minutes of doing this activity. So we can see straight away that the implications are that in the second half of the game that the athlete or the player is not going to be able to sprint as fast as they were able to do in the first half of the game. So that's big implications, particularly when you're thinking about defenders coping with an oncoming striker and vice versa for a striker trying to get onto a through ball, that they won't have the speed because they haven't got the energy to be able to achieve it. So we have to think about how that we can remedy that, uh, maybe in, in the tactics that are employed to compensate that, it, that this is going to happen. And this is going to happen whether you're well-trained or not well-trained, it's just the degree to which it happens. So it might be a change of tactics um, in terms of rather than popping um, those kind of balls through, which are balls they've got to run onto, that they play with much shorter passes or, or you, you're going for, for the kind of activities where they don't have to sprint so fast to get onto, onto the ball. Um, and the implications are for the defenders is that you now have to think about how you're going to, to react and how you're going to sprint to cover any attacks that are coming in because if you've got players now that are limited in the size of the, in the amount of PCR available then they have to conserve what they've got left and this is why we get more errors occurring in the last quarter of a game of football than any other point during the game because you're limited by the amount of fuel that you have to do this kind of work now, here's some nice data. This is, this is, um, some of this we're not going to necessarily look at, but this is from a, um, a fairly recent paper uh, by Moore's group, um, and they've looked at muscle metabolites. Now, we're only going to focus on a couple of these, and we're going to look at this one here. Now, this is creatine phosphate. So here we've got the CP content. So if we look before the match, so a millimoles per kilogram um, uh, dry weight. So they've, 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 taken, they've done a muscle biopsy, and they've, they've, they've dried it out and so on before the game. And so you've got a score of 88. So after, after uh, the, um, the match, it's dropped to 79. So there's a significant decrease in the creatine phosphate content. And then what they did, um, they made them do an intense period in the first half. So they, they, they actually made them do an intense period of sprints, and it went down to 76. And then they made them do an intense period at the end of the, in, in the middle of the second half, and it went down to 67. So you can see that even within the periods, it's gone down 88 to 79 in real terms, but it actually went from 88 to 76 during the first half, which tells you that there was some restoration. You see, there was some low intensity exercise, so they got some of the PCR being restored. And in the second half, it went down from 88 to 67, and then back up to 79 at the end of the match. So again, there was some restoration after doing this high intensity period of work. But look at that in relation to the ATP content. The ATP content barely changes. In other words, we are resynthesizing the ATP primarily through the, the CP, but also through other energy substrates that we are going to look at through for the remainder um, of this module.